What if I told you almost any greenhouse, high tunnel, or hoop house could be built simply by following 20 steps? These steps are what we would call an order of operations. And in this video, I'm going to take you through the exact order of operations I've developed through my experiences building hundreds of high tunnels, greenhouses, and hoop houses. Building these structures can be intimidating, but I've found that for 90% of hoop house, high tunnel, and greenhouse builds, there is a predictable and often ideal beginning, middle, and end to the project. Simply put, if you can execute the correct sequence of tasks in the correct order, you can almost ensure that you'll have a successful greenhouse build, or at least it will be way more likely to achieve. Not following a proven order of operations for your build could spell disaster, so make sure you stick around to the end of this video so you can avoid costly missteps. We're going to hop into the order of operations from the very beginning at step number one. But before we do, there is one important thing to note. Order of operations are vital, but they're not technically instructions. Instructions provide way more intricacy and show the details for how to execute each step. If instructions and a fully configured DIY kit are what you seek, you can check out the DIY kits we offer here at Tunnel Vision Hoops through the link in the description or this QR code. Now that that's out of the way, here are the order of operations that will apply to 90 to 95% of hoop house, high tunnel, and greenhouse builds. First, site selection. The goal with this is to pick a spot for your greenhouse. You want this spot to get sun, drain well, and be relatively flat and level. Those are the obvious ones, but try also to consider your operation when selecting a site. It's proximity to other structures, it's proximity to your driveway, how simple would it be to bring soil or other materials into the greenhouse if electricity is part of your future greenhouse plans, how will its location impact the future price of running electrical to that structure? And of course, always take into consideration any setback requirements that your municipality has. See if your city requires any permits, if you need stamped drawings, or anything of the like. So this is the point of the process. You'd reach out and try to get a green light for pursuing your project. Second, site preparation. The goal with this step is to get your land ready for the greenhouse or high tunnel installation. Before you do anything with site work or land preparation, you have to call the utility protection services for your locality. Here in Ohio, it's OUPS, Ohio Utility Protection Services. You tell them what you're going to do, how deep you're going, and then they make sure you're not going to hit a gas line or some other utility line that will cause detriment to your project or your safety. This is extremely important and must be done before any site work. Once that's out of the way, if you want to level your site, this is when you would do it. And you might be saying, well, of course, don't I have to level my site before I install one of these structures? And the answer is not necessarily. And I'll get more into this in a future video. If you do plan to grade your site and make everything level where you'll be putting your structure, remember to grade the site so that it's larger, both in width and length, than your actual structure. You don't want to have a pad for your structure that is the exact size of your structure. You want to have a little wiggle room so that you're making sure you're, you're hitting all the points you want to hit. Third, squaring your structure. This is where you run the strings to, one, determine exactly where your structure is going to be installed, and two, to make sure your structure is installed as a rectangle as opposed to a rhombus. You most likely don't want a rhombus or trapezoidal greenhouse, so running strings and squaring your structure is actually one of the most important steps to ensuring a successful greenhouse build. Next up is the foundation of your structure. For the DIY kits we sell at Tunnel Vision Hoops, this means it is time to focus on the ground post anchors or the base frame anchors. We do have how-to videos on both of these methods and I'll link to them in the description. For ground post anchors, this is where you'd pound the posts to the recommended depth or you'd auger out holes so you can concrete the ground posts in place. I've found that about 90% of the people installing ground post anchors or base frame anchored structures ultimately do so without concrete. So for most of you, just knowing that this step is gonna require you to pound in some ground posts is the furthest you'll probably have to go. For those of you wanting to install a concrete pad, while I've never personally installed a concrete pad, I have worked on projects for clients where they were installing one. And usually what this meant was I would install the ground post anchors in concrete, so I'd auger out holes and put in the concrete, and then I would pause my construction. I would let the utility professionals, you know, the electricity, the water, the sewer, and the concrete company work together to pour a pad and then I would return to the job site to complete the next steps of the project. Since I haven't poured a pad myself, I would recommend that anyone looking to do so consult the company they're using to pour the pad to see what they suggest for the sequencing of events. Because once you have a concrete pad down, it's kind of hard to put anything underneath it. Now it's time to assemble your bows. Some bows will have truss rafters while others will not. But regardless, this is the point of the project where I attach my trusses to the bow, assemble the bow, and connect the bows to the foundation of the structure, which in most cases 
our ground post anchors. For our structures at Tunnel Vision Hoops, most of the bows for our structures will slide into ground post anchors, will stop at either a bolt or a punched hole, and we'll repeat this process until all of the bows have been installed. Next, corner braces. These are very valuable structural elements, and it is important that these are installed immediately following the installation of your bows. They are used to plumb your end bows, and getting these in at this point of the process ensures that the hip rails and purlins that you're installing later on all fit correctly. Next, we're going to install hip rails. These usually run at hip or chest level, and they connect to every bow they come in contact with through the full length of the structure. I like doing these before the baseboards and purlins because this is the step where I plumb every interior bow, making sure they're oriented correctly and attaching the bow directly to the hip rail. This ensures that your bows are all plumb before getting too far in the process. Having all of your bows be plumb is very important for if you're trying to create a structure that is really strong for shedding snow, for example. Next, I like to do the baseboards. These run along the ground on both sides of the structure. Whether lumber or galvanized steel, this is the point of the project where I install these. Technically, I could install the baseboards later on in the process, but in my mind, if I've just installed the hip rails and I'm already working on the sides of the structure, I might as well knock these off next. Next, I'm putting the purlins in place. These are full-length members that run from one end of the structure to the other end of the structure, and they connect at every point they're contacting a bow. For our high tunnels, these are 1.315 inch outer diameter steel, or in other words, 1 and 3.8 inch top rail. Most of our structures come with three or five of these, but I always like to do the centermost purlin first and then finish off with the side purlins that fall between the center purlin and the hip rails. Now we're halfway through, and if you feel like it would be nice to reference these order of operations in writing so you can access them as needed or even print them out for your greenhouse build, I put all 20 steps that are part of this video into an order of operations PDF document, and I'm making that document available to you for free. All you'd have to do is follow the link in the description, join our email newsletter and the very first email I send you will include a link to a downloadable, savable, and printable PDF document. Now to the next step. After the purlins have been installed, I like to install my peak braces. These are steel members that provide additional wind bracing to the structure. They are typically installed near the peak at each end and they span the spaces in between the purlins. There are usually two to four per end wall and I find that I like doing these after the purlins because doing the purlins first create little sections in between the bows which helps me determine exactly where to put the peak braces. Next on the install list is my end wall assembly. Whether you're DIYing a lumber framed end wall or you're installing one of our square steel tube framed end wall kits, this is the point in the process where I'd assemble them. There is a lot that goes into assembling end walls, including framing for any doors, fans, shutters, heater exhaust locations, and more, so taking your time to assemble the end wall correctly is extremely important. After the end wall framing has been built, it's time to install any entrances and or end wall ventilation. Installing doors or vents at this part of the process is ideal, especially if any of these are exterior mounted. Getting these in now reduces any risk of damaging end wall plastic later in the process. That is why I prefer to get interior mounted doors or vents installed at this point as well. Essentially, my approach is I can't damage end wall plastic if I haven't installed it yet. After my door and vents have been installed, it's now time for me to install single aluminum spring wire channel. If your structure is going to be covered with pliable 4mm, 6mm, 9mm, or 12mm greenhouse plastic, you'll need a way to attach it. So this is the part of the project where I attach spring wire channel to the face of my end walls around any doors and vent framing I have. I also attach single aluminum channel over the top of each end bow. If you're covering your ends with polycarbonate, you would not install this on your end walls or over the top of your end bow, but you'd still install single channel on your side bow sections where you're going to have your corner wind panels. Next, and after the single aluminum spring wire channel has been installed, you can now start installing your greenhouse plastic. This happens in a few phases with the first phase being our corner wind panels. Corner wind panels are located on the sides of the structure, as you might have guessed it, in the corners. And these prevent winds from getting behind the roll-up sides in the shoulder seasons in the spring and the fall. The only time I would wait to install the corner wind panels is, once again, if I were to be installing polycarbonate covered end walls. And it would only be after I install the polycarbonate on the end walls and the channel that goes over the end bows for the polycarbonate that I would install the corner panels. But for most people using pliable greenhouse plastic, definitely focus on doing the corner wind panels first, and then you can move on to the next phase of your greenhouse plastic install. 
which is end wall plastic covering. This is the next phase of the greenhouse plastic installation. If you're covering your end walls with pliable greenhouse plastic, this is when I would take that task on. We like covering the ends with separate pieces of greenhouse plastic because we feel it helps get a tighter greenhouse plastic installation, both for the end wall covers and for the top cover, which we haven't installed yet. And that's one of the main reasons we're installing the end walls at this step. Once my end wall plastic has been installed and I'm satisfied with how tight it looks, I'm ready to move on to the top cover. This is when I would install the main piece of greenhouse plastic. And that's true whether I'm installing just one layer of plastic or if I'm installing two layers of plastic and inflating them with an inflation blower fan. We have extremely in-depth videos showing how to install single or double layer plastic, so I won't get into that here. For the purposes of this video, just know that I installed the top cover greenhouse plastics immediately following the installation of end wall plastic. Next, after the greenhouse top plastic has been installed, it's time to install your roll-up sides. In most cases, I like to make roll-up sides out of the same greenhouse plastic I used for the top cover. That is to say, I installed a top cover plastic that is wide enough so it rests on the ground a little bit on both sides of the structure. Installing roll-up sides will require me to assemble my roll bar, connect any operators to the roll bar itself, and then attaching the greenhouse plastic to the roll bar and giving it a couple of tests. Next, after the roll-up sides have been installed, it's time to put on some form of anti-billow system for your roll-up sides. In most cases, this will be anti-billow rope. If you're installing roll-up sides, you absolutely need to install something to prevent the sides from clanging around in the wind and possibly damaging the actual structure itself or damaging the greenhouse plastic that's on top of the structure. One of the main ways we do anti-billow rope systems on our structures is by installing easy snap hooks or eye bolts along the baseboard and the hip rail and then running rope in a zigzag pattern from one end of the structure all the way to the other. This keeps your roll bar pressed against the side of the structure in a way that prevents it from moving too much in the wind. I like to trim the greenhouse plastic as one of the last tasks. This includes trimming any of the excess end wall plastic that's hanging down from the interior of the structure and any of the top cover greenhouse plastic that's extending past the end hoops. I usually only leave a couple inches of greenhouse plastic, so I take scissors and trim it down to the hip rail where the roll-up side attaches. After trimming your greenhouse plastic, if you followed the this order of operations for your greenhouse, high tunnel, or hoop house build, you're probably ready to get some plants in the ground. And if you liked any of the structures shown in this video, I'll have a link in the description where you can learn more about them or you can follow this QR code. Thanks for watching.